I told the fellow who was handing out handouts that uh, if he missed anybody, he could pass them around now. So, if uh, where's our handout, man? <laughs> All right. So you can look on with your friends. I like handouts because it gives you something to take away from the evening. Right? Um, whenever anybody says all those nice things about me that Fred did, I think of my sister who raised seven children and that relativizes everything. <laughs> I want to talk about faith, reason, and culture in Christianity and Islam. In the wake of John Paul's exploratory encyclical, Fides et Ratio, which came out in 1998, Faith and Reason, one of my confreres, then serving as rector of a Catholic seminary in Africa, was invited to Rome for a global consultation on the complex relations between faith and reason. His African perspective emboldened him to add culture to the diptych faith and reason to form the triad, reason, culture, and faith. When he told me, I was initially impressed by his unwitting assertion of insertion of Charles Sanders' purse into the discussion. Any polarity is ever in danger of becoming just that, a polarity. So a third will invariably be needed. That's why we have marriage counselors. <laughs> Beyond that, the general recommendation, however, I wish to explore his recommendation as a way of expanding the faith reason discussion in a way which will invariably entail, as we shall see, a keen ear for analogous language. Indeed, it is surprising that a person so cognizant of culture as Carol Wotiwa, Pope John Paul II, should apparently elide it, omit it, in his telling treatment of faith and reason, especially after having noted in the chapter detailing the interaction between theology and philosophy, how, and these are his words, reason itself, in accordance with which scripture, uh, Christians experience their faith, is soaked in the culture of the place, culture of the place nearest to it, and in its turn ensures that with the progress of time, its own nature is bit by bit transformed. That's why I'm absolutely bullish getting American students to study abroad, so we begin to learn something, right? My work on Aquinas has shown me, despite his frequentation of Paris as a venue for teaching and scholarship, his Mediterranean roots positioned him to encounter an Islamic philosophy of Hellenistic inspiration, as Louis Gaudet put it, to determine how to put at the service of Christian thought in general, as well as to facilitate his specific task of th showing how theology could be a science, or theologia could be scientia, because scientia is not the same thing as we think of as science. I proposed how an encounter with cultural difference, fertilized by Aquinas' prescient metaphysical elaboration of faith in a free creator is shared by Jews, Christians, and Muslims, something which all these communities averred, but which each had articulated in diverse ways. However it may, be, may have been the dominant role which creation must play in Islam, which motivated Islamic thinkers to develop this article of faith far more than either Jews or Christians. But while it can be said that the coming down of the Quran to humankind via the prophet parallels the covenant of God with Israel and the incarnation of the word in Jesus, what the Quran asserts in countless ways is the origin of all things in the one God to the point where their central religious thinker, Al-Ghazali, will insist that the meaning of faith and divine unity is there is no agent but God Most High. That is, in the absence of either covenant or incarnation, the creating activity of the one God is central for Islam. Though to be sure, it is the verses of the Quran, and the Arabic word there is ayat in the plural, 
which alert human beings to recognize the things in this world as signs or ayat of the presence of the Creator. So how can we recognize things as signs? Or in other words, how can we recognize things as created? It took Augustine well after his acceptance of the truth of the Christian faith to be able to interrogate the earth, all things that are in the earth, the sea and the depths of the creeping things, the winds that blow, the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars, until they cried out with one great voice, he made us. In their very being, they had become for him signs that they were created by one God and freely so. Yet it is the common testimony of those who live among Muslims that their cultural formation offers them a palpable sense of God's presence in their lives. Something similar can be said of observant Jews, their sense of the reality of God. Famously, Jews will contend passionately with God, yet resist denying Him, even while renouncing His claims on them. In each case, these pervasive attitudes can be traced to the way which religious practices shape the contours of their lives. The Shabbat for Jews, the ritual prayer, Salat, five times a day for Muslims. My suspicion is that recurrent practices of this sort provide each cultural group with a paradigm for their understanding of the cosmos. Nor need the practices be religious. Recurrent practices of other sorts like shopping can shape mentalities as well, giving a characteristic face to human ideals like freedom. Indeed, when President Reagan took Premier Khrushchev on a visit to the discount store, touting it as freedom, Khrushchev could only query, is that freedom? So it seems that our access to any lofty ideal will be by way of the practices which enact it in our culture. This unsurprising statement can be corroborated by what happens to us when we experience other ways of shopping or eating a meal. Often the variance between our practice and those of different cultures will make us aware that there can be better ways of doing what we set out to do. So we learn that there are variant ways of eating or shopping or praying. Teaching and learning seen as correlatives can differ dramatically, say, between state schools in Egypt and those conducted there by members of a religious community. Indeed, the difference is so telling that Muslim families, ambitious for the young children, prefer the Catholic schools. Children learn better. All this is quite understandable once we are reminded that education is an analogous term. The attitude of students, of teachers to students in a school conducted by a religious community reflects the religious formation of the teachers themselves in their care for the children, while teaching in a state school may easily be bereft of any hint of that. Government teachers may be doing their job by prevailing standards, but parents can see that the results far fall short of those elicited by the alternative milieu. Now, if practices, ordinary or sublime, shape our understanding of key notions like freedom or education, then the same must be true for honorifics like rationality. Yet mentioning this can elicit the specter of relativism for philosophers. So let us return to a seminal article by Peter Winch in 1964. That's really ancient history, isn't it? Variously reprinted, entitled on understanding a primitive society. In it, Peter Winch takes issue with the yet earlier pronouncement of Alastair McIntyre, presuming the invariance of reason Peter, to show how reason will always be exercised differently in diverse milieus, themselves shaped by differing sets of characteristic practices. Since this very strategy that I just outlined, which Peter Winch introduced here, has, in, has later become the hallmark of McIntyre's work, recalling this debate of the 60s 
can help remind us how our intellectual culture has shifted over the past half century. The question is simple. How can the Azandi or any people continue to pray for the success of their crops once they buy into modern methods of agriculture? Winch begins by taking issue with the way in which the distinguished British anthropologist Evans Pritchard had described Azandi's supplicatory practices in his landmark book, Witchcraft, Oracles of Magic Among the Azandi, published in 1937. Contrasting their efficacy, the efficacy of these prayers, with fertilizers and other modern methods. Winch proposes to make contact with his Western readers by noting how, in Judeo-Christian cultures, the concept of, if it be thy will, as developed in the story of Job, is clearly central to the matter I am discussing. Acknowledging the vast difference between the Zandi magic rites and the Christian prayers of supplication, he offers that they are alike in that they do or may express an attitude towards contingencies. He expands this notion by insisting whether a man sees point in what he is doing will depend on whether he is able to see any utility in his multifarious interests, activities, and relationship with others. What sort of sense he sees in his life will depend on the nature of this unity. He then criticizes his interlocutor, McIntyre, writing in 1962, for missing this dimension of the matter in his treatment of Azandi magic. He can only see it as a misguided technique for producing consumer goods. But Azandi's crops are not just potential objects of consumption. The life he lives, his relation with his fellows, his chances for acting decently or doing evil may all spring from his relation to his crops. Indeed, as Winch puts it, our blindness to the point of primitive modes of life is a corollary to the pointlessness of much of our own. Capitalism even turns agriculture into another mode of production. I introduce this scandalously truncated version of their exchange to remind us what Alastair McIntyre himself has gone on to detail, how cultural shifts can effect alterations in our very criteria of rationality, and that our efforts to grasp others' practices in matters which challenge our presumed categories can indeed reveal lacunae in those very presumptions. Before illustrating this dramatic reversal, we shall have to excoriate the specter of relativism. But we will first need the reminder with which Limp Winch leaves us, that the very conception of human life involves certain fundamental notions, which I shall call limiting notions, which have an obvious ethical dimension, and which indeed, in a sense, determine the ethical space within which the possibilities of good or evil in human life can be exercised. Winch appropriates T.S. Eliot's trinity of birth, copulation, and death to suggest that the very notion of human life is limited by these conceptions. Moreover, the indication that these are indeed limiting notions demands that we be able to speak of them analogously as we find them articulated differently in diverse cultures. As to relativism. It's crucial to note how enlightened presupposi enlightenment presuppositions about reason and truth raise relativism to the stature of a threat. For they presume a normative sense set of cri rational criteria available to all over against which any claim to other sets of criteria is utterly unsettling. This is what makes a bugbear of relativism that there are no longer any operative norms across human discourse, so, the, so power or even violence will have to arbitrate. Yet like earlier debates over natural law, there may be other ways of thinking about these criteria which are not so laden with specific beliefs, but which have to do with the fact that persons 
formed in quite diverse traditions, do, in effect, talk with one another. Indeed, once the idol of pure reason has been shattered and we can learn to accept diverse ways of arriving at conclusions, we will also find that we can employ the skills learned in our tradition to follow the reasoning in another. Traditions, in other words, may indeed be relative to one another in ways that can prove mutually fruitful rather than isolating. Traditions which prove to be so will be those which avail themselves of human reason in their development. So the patterns of stress and strain in their evolution will display their capacity for exploiting the resources of reason. In short, relativism, the bugbear, gives way to the human fact that all inquiry takes place within a tradition and the specter which it evoked turns out to be the residual shadow of faith in pure reason. That is, in the pretension of human, reason, human inquiry bereft of any tradition. Incidentally, an authentic tradition can be distinguished from an ideology by its capacity for self-criticism, though this attempt at normative definition also reminds us how so-called religious traditions can easily topple over into an ideology, namely, I have the truth and you don't. So the discovery on the part of reason that every inquiry employs presuppositions which cannot themselves be rationally justified opens the way to self-knowledge on the part of enlightenment philosophy itself, which then must take its place within the traditions. And once it has been accomplished, the specter of relativism gives way to the task of developing the skills needed to negotiate among traditions, which can be negotiated because they can be found to be related to one another. I think this happens best when we enter into a human relationship with someone who comes perhaps from a completely different faith tradition and begin to talk with one another about what we believe and learn that we know and come to discover what we believe much better through their challenges. And since we have become accustomed to associating faith with tradition, we must then renounce the operative enlightenment view representing faith as an addendum to the human condition. For if that view itself reflects a tradition whose account can be rendered in historical terms as a reaction to the devastating religious wars in Europe, then the enlightenment will itself display a recognizable convictional basis and faith will once more emerge as part of a shared human legacy, though no longer distorted by its authoritarian shadow. Then the intellectual task on the part of reason operative in any tradition which survives the test of time becomes one of learning how such traditions develop, most often, in fact, by learning from and assimilating other traditions. In this way, reason becomes a functional notion displayed in practices which cut across traditional boundaries rather than expressing a set of substantive beliefs which must be adhered to in those very terms before discourse can be undertaken. Rationality will then show itself in practices which can be followed and understood by persons operating in similar fashion from different grounding convictions. When I go into a meditation room in my favorite airport, Amsterdam, in Schiphol on my way to Africa or Asia, I'm always accompanied by Muslims. And I greet them, uh, salam alaikum, and explain that we're praying, aren't we, in different ways to the same God. These different traditions all share the need to talk about what they believe. Hence the analogy with debates about natural law. What is sufficiently shared as to be dubbed natural need not be substantive norms regarding human actions and they're, because they're often very different, but rather the overriding demand that any normative law must express itself in coherent discourse. That very activity which displays the hallmark, 
the, rather the fruitfulness of human ingenuity, also contains operative terms by which astute participant observers can recognize analogies across traditions of inquiry. As Socrates, by assembling linguistic reminders for Thrasymachus, made him abandon his projected discourse without Socrates having to exert any force at all. For those reminders have to do with the possibility of any discourse at all, and so governed the tradition Thrasymachus was defending, as well as the totally opposed one which Socrates had set out to elaborate. Yet book one of the Republic hardly com confirms Socrates' arguments. It simply displays the terms of any debate. One well, may, of course, go on to embed those forms in a richer framework as Plato does in subsequent books of the Republic. But the exchange with Thrasymachus in book one stands on its own as displaying the coherence of the linguistic practices which make the rest possible. In fact, Thrasymachus goes out angry because he recognizes that Socrates has him and he can't continue discourse because Socrates has laid bare the very laws of discourse. So that's when fights start. We will need to elaborate that coherence into a philosophy, for practices alone seldom offer a persuasive display of their own cogency. Yet these reflections should remind us that elaborations are secondary and may even be manifold, though they will be able to be elucidated relative to one another. So reason, in our pluralistic age, assumes the shape of dialogue a path to progressive mutual understanding which the political theorist Roxanne Eubin dubs a dialogical model of interpretation. Yet dialogue can only take place among persons. Systems cannot converse with one another. And even dialogue between persons can degenerate into a dialogue of the deaf if each one comes as a representative of a position. So the prerequisite for dialogue among persons seems to be a shared interest in pursuing the truth of the matter, no matter how firm are one's convictions on the subject. Yet if those very convictions presume that the path one is tra traveling is the only way to arrive at truth in such matters, then the goal has already been circumscribed and dialogue is unnecessary. So we see that truth must transcend any given conceptuality. And, and that each participant must be committed to questing after it. My favorite expression of Bernard Lonigan's was that the world divides between those who are searching for truth, searching for understanding, and those who need certitude. Need is a psychological verb. Searching is an intentional verb. So we, so yet as I've already remarked, what once seemed an obvious path is no longer available to us. That philosophy or untrammeled rational inquiry represents a neutral achievement accessible to those willing to renounce their particular paths. In this sense, we cannot consistently espouse an account of religious pluralism, which retains the modern presumption that we philosophers can survey diverse religious traditions from a superior vantage point. The alternative to presuming such objective neutrality is to turn to an intersubjective encounter with persons prepared in the way we have described, willing to search for, together for the truth to which they are singly committed yet which they may name quite differently. Such a commitment turns out to be uncannily close to that classical view of friendship first articulated by Aristotle. Indeed, once we, reali once we realize that only friends of this sort are able to continue their conversations despite disagreement, then friendship will prove more telling to our search for truth 
than agreement. I want to I want to illustrate now an, an intercultural example of faith and reason interacting, and that's the second part of, of, of this reflection. Let me illustrate this point by showing how attending to debates endemic to another tradition can illuminate our own. Yet like the points of contention between Winch and McIntyre, we have to unscramble a complex genealogy to do so. For we, we must first deconstruct the Orientalist misreading of the faith of philosophical inquiry in the Islamic world to discover ways in which that sinuous unfolding, properly understood, can help us discover fruitful interactions between faith and reason in our own tradition. We are familiar with the standard story, you may not be, but here it is, right? The standard story of Arabic and Islamic philosophy, for it represents a modern Western construction. It begins with the spectacular overtaking of the hinterlands of the Byzantine Empire in the 7th century by disciplined and motivated bands from the Arabian Peninsula, who before long sought to assimilate the high culture of that empire. Utilizing the offices of Syriac translators, they made key Hellenic philosophical texts available in Arabic, facilitating the emergence of signal thinkers like Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, Avicenna, and Averroes. As the, Latin, as the equivalent Latin names illustrate, that is, Avicenna's Arabic name is Ibn Sina, Averroes' Arabic name is Ibn Rushd, and we know them by the Latin names, as those insinuate, uh, these philosophers, called philosophi in Islam, inspired cognate Christian medieval thinkers, with Ibn Rush naming an entire way of thinking Latin Averroism. The import of this East-West cultural exchange in the 11th through the 13th centuries proved especially significant for the West, while the movement in the Islamic world was soon to lose its vitality. In the standard story, the culprit, was a, the culprit was another Islamic thinker, Al-Ghazali, whose, whose trenchant attacks on the philosophers is said to have sharply curtailed their influence in Islamic culture, indeed, to have spelt the demise of reason in Islam. That's Benedict XVI in Regensburg. In the fresh story I shall propose, Al-Ghazali will also function axially, but less as a culprit than as announcing a second philosophical phase in Islam to be carried out in the heartland of Islamic civilization as the center returned from Cordoba, what we now know as Spain, to Baghdad, turning on such luminaries as Sukhrawardi, Ibn al-Arabi, and Mullah Sadra. Al-Ghazali's dramatic role is presaged in the work of Moses ben Maimon, whom we know as Maimonides. A Jew so thoroughly Im embedded in the Islamic ape that he may, may well be classified as an Islamic philosopher. A sustained inquiry, including Ibn Sina, Al-Ghazali, and Maimonides, as well as Thomas Aquinas, had sought ways to formulate a coherent account of creation which highlighted the Creator's freedom since Jews, Muslims, and Christians each had a crucial stake in the outcome. Indeed, including Maimonides and Aquinas helps us to see how Islamic philosophical theology resonated beyond the borders of Islam itself. For the issue of the Creator's freedom underscores the unique relation of Creator to creatures in each Abrahamic tradition, though it proved inherently difficult to articulate philosophically. Indeed, the celebrated emanation scheme introduced into Islamic philosophy by Al-Farabi and elaborated by Ibn Sina could serve to elide the peculiarity of this relation by naming the one as the first. If the one, if you will, we will call the creator is the first, then he's first in a row, first in a series. For despite Al-Farabi's eloquent delineation of the uniqueness of his first, 
his strategic employment of the scheme of logical deduction to model the relation of the one to the ensuing many effectively introduces that one as the originating axiomatic principle which differs from subsequent premises only in their functional place in the system. Moreover, the fact that such an axiomatic model also introduces logical necessity runs counter to the role that the creator's freedom plays, for only a free creator can enjoy the privileges that oneness which Muslim traditions enshrines in Tawheed, Jewish thought, in God's unity over against idolatry, in which the four century long Christian path to tri unity displays as well. In short, if the origination of the universe is a matter of necessity, its source cannot qualify as a creator in the sense demanded by each of the Abrahamic faiths. One of the central complaints Al Ghazali lodged against the philosophers in Islam, because they were mesmerized by this emanation scheme. Yet the rhetorical form of these respective revelations proved unable to clearly articulate such distinctions, allowing the creator to be pictured anthropomorphically in the fashion of the demiurge of Plato's Timaeus. Nevertheless, a free creator would have to be distinct from creatures to be the creator so the uniqueness of the relation of creators to creatures will emerge forcibly. So Ghazali was correct to underscore the inability of those whom we identify with the initial phase of Islamic philosophical theology to develop the metaphysical strategies needed to relate creatures to their transcendent origin. Yet his critique did have the effect of ushering in a second phase of thinkers all beholden to Avicenna's axial distinction between essence and existing to articulate the sui generis character of the relation between a free creator and the universe. The fact that the presence and the valence of this second phase of thinkers is hardly recognized in the West suggests how the standard story of philosophy's demise in the Islamicate reinforced the picture of reason encapsulated at the, at the Enlightenment. For the reason these later thinkers espoused will be intimately intertwined with faith in a free creator. Three figures emerged to mark our phase two. Sukhrawardi, who lived in the 12th century, Ibn al-Arabi in the 13th, and Sadr al-Din al-Shirazi or Mullah Sadra in the 16th. While Ibn al-Arabi actually journeyed from Andalusia to the Levant, from Spain to the, what we call the Middle East, to carry out his extensive and intensive inquiries in Damascus, each of these thinkers embodies that shift from west to east in ways which will need to be nuanced from a, peripet for, for, from a peripatetic and largely Aristotelian philosophical milieu to one more sympathetically Platonist. Moreover, given the fact that their exposition will contend with the ineffable relation of creator to creatures, one will find recurrent recourse to poetic and allegorical tropes in their writings, although it will be misleading to present their mode of inquiry as attempting to transcend philosophical discourse. And one may, indeed, one may note how Ibn Sina's later allegorical writing presaged this development. So there is little doubt that classical Islamic philosophy in both phases espouses philosophical inquiry as a way of bringing inquirers themselves closer to reality, in this case to the creator of all. Following Pierre Hadot, we can regard these thinkers as underscoring the existential end considered endemic to philosophical inquiry itself among the ancients, a view which has come to prove quite amenable to a postmodern sensibility. And it is precisely this feature which makes Al-Ghazali so axial a figure in our story with a valence quite opposite to that in the standard account. 
Both Muslim and Christian traditions turn here to practices which can serve to move our understanding beyond formulations, especially when the structure of the formulae themselves displays their insufficiency. Naming God, we know that we can never understand as just, we know we can never understand divine justice. Pierre Hado shows how ancient philosophy invariably incorporated practices as part of its method. A longtime translator of Plotinus, it appears that the very effort of translating, itself a spiritual exercise, alerted him to the difference between a modern and a classical conception of the virtues required to do philosophy. Indeed, modern philosophy seldom alludes to intellectual virtues, contending itself rather with propositional attitudes. Yet when one presses the attitude dimension, something like virtue, in fact, emerges. That is to say, modernity's account of what philosophy is and how one engages in it may well prove inadequate to the activity itself, which could also explain why philosophy continues to criticize itself and not merely its findings. The focus of philosophers like Stephen Toulmin and Alastair McIntyre on practices can help us see how Hado's presentation of ancient philosophy is far more pertinent than an historical exercise, as his recent summary statement in What is Philosophy articulates. Mullah Sadra, my 16th century Iranian philosopher, will explicitly contend that we will need some special illumination to attain a properly metaphysical standpoint. Lacking something of that sort, as Rudy Tavelde intimates, Aquinas' crucial formula that the very being of God is to be cannot but appear ungrammatical. And ungrammatical it is, of course, but deliberately so. Yet those who are attuned to what it displays rather than to what it cannot say will be able to make connections with Plotinus pointing to the one beyond being, to find both Aquinas and Mulasadra engaged in a similar struggle to attain the requisite metaphysical standpoint beyond the common conception of being. And it was his own engagement with Plotinus' intellectual journey which taught Pierre Hado the need for spiritual exercises to follow his mentor. Indeed, the master-disciple relationship and all that it portends offers a useful way of characterizing the exercises relevant to attaining this metaphysical standpoint. As I have been suggesting throughout, Hadot's recommendations may offer Western philosophers a way uh, to appreciate the strategies of these Eastern philosophical theologians with the demands such strategies make on those who would practice them. There can be no demonstration of these matters, of course, since existing defies definition. Yet we are ineluctably led to realize that we cannot understand created things properly without a sustained attempt to grasp the internal link they have with the Creator in their very existing. Yet while this mode of inquiry exceeds the bounds of philosophical inquiry as normally practiced by Islamic philosophers in our first stage, like Ibn Sina, it is arguable that they too realized that an authentically philosophical search must move beyond these into more esoteric arenas. Yet Mullah Sadra's in inspiration is clearly Ibn al-Arabi. As anyone acquainted with William Chittick's lucid presentation of that illustrious sheikh will immediately detect. By using existing as the fulcrum, one can detect continuity in intent from Al-Farabi to Mullah Sadra with comparative links to Aquinas. The goal is wisdom, shared by what we have remarked as two phases in Islamic philosophy Though the second phase reveals a marked shift to incorporate that goal more explicitly with the practices which allow one to approach it. For that approach is redolent 
of the Sufi desire to come near to the one from whom all that is continually derives. So the ineffable relation between that one and all that derives from it becomes an existential journey for the blessed inquirer since our very inability to articulate the relation between creator and creatures invites us rather to traverse it personally. Inshallah, that is as God wills it. Now all this clearly breaches the bounds of what we in the West normally identify as philosophy from the strict boundary between philosophy and theology which neo-Thomist ideology established in Catholic colleges and universities to the unilateral hegemony which analytic philosophers of religion claim over matters full of theological, exempting them from tracking sophisticated intellectual developments in the unfolding of Christian thought. Yet the, faith, yet the late and indomitable Richard Rorty gives indirect testimony to the bankruptcy of this thoroughly modernist view of philosophy when he personally abandoned it to announce its demise. But what if the second phase of Islamic philosophical inquiry offers us a fresh start in its effort to elucidate a robust faith in a free creator by expanding the bounds of the earlier phase, which enlightened the philosophers with some support by Pope Benedict, had jejunely identified with reason itself. Allow me a simple and concluding illustration. Some years ago, my colleague at Notre Dame, Alvin Planning, elaborated with appropriate, appropriate logical finesse a way of defending human reason in the face of a theistic affirmation of an all-knowing and all-powerful God, soon dubbed the free will defense. This is what people call uh, Planning's ploy here. He showed how, on a strong libertarian view of freedom, we can assert human beings to be free, both from determination by cosmic forces and from divine influence, going on to insist that such libertarian freedom must be an essential ingre ingredient of any Christian philosophy. Always uncomfortable with this ploy of Al's and my colleague Al's, it took a suggestion by Brian Davis in You Blackfriars to help me see why I was uncomfortable, allowing an obvious comparison with developments in Islamic philosophical theology to show how to deconstruct Plantinga's so-called free will defense. Brian Davis noted, again quite simply, how the penchant to remove human freedom from the purview of a free creator simply misconstrues a creator's agency as if it bore any resemblance to causal determination. Early, early Islamic uh, religious thought called Kalam had clearly demonstrated a similar move motivated by the same concerns when it, when it initially removed from human, free human actions from the ambit of the creator's activity as though humans acting freely had to be creators in their own right. The latent premise here, implicitly a work in Plantinga and others, enamored of his ploy and the, these Islamic, early Islamic thinkers, is that free human action must be a creation ex nihilo if it is to be truly free. These Islamic religious thinkers soon realized, however, that such an intellectual strategy would effectively remove an inordinate portion of cre creation itself from the creator's sway, namely all of our actions. Right? So they came to adopt another path whose sinuous ways would require too much time to elaborate. But the fact remains that the school which had promoted human freedom by exempting it from a creator's ambit, so-called Mutazilites in Islam, has regularly been touted in the West as just that, defenders of human freedom. What is instructive is that analytic philosophers of religion have fallen into the same trap, and that I would suggest for two reasons. First, that an untrammeled 
libertarian account of human freedom suits our cultural climate, which is one of the supermarkets, and more acutely because they have sig signally failed as a group to develop the metaphysical strategies elaborated by the second phase of Islamic philosophers of elucidating the sui generis relation between creator and creatures. And I can only attempt to explain this obvious lacuna by identifying their modernist pension to do it all from philosophy in relative ignorance of the theological developments attending free creation in their own tradition as well as in other Abrahamic faiths. Perhaps this final political polemical jab will suggest why I have developed this foray into faith and reason as substantially affected by culture and cultural differences, and done so in a deliberately comparative way. Is there indeed any other way to carry out an inquiry in philosophical theology in our time, any way other than a comparative one? Thank you. Some questions? Or I'll try. Yeah, give, give folks a chance to uh, pull out. Yeah. Come on, we back here. Hi. You said that uh, to really inspire a debate, you have to have people who are willing to be open and to really honestly seek the truth. So how do you do that when sometimes large groups of people are so ideological and they're so, <coughs> you described the ideologies, just fervently firm in their views on things? you know, not really open to seeking the truth. How do you break through that to kind of start an honest debate? Do people understand that question? Yeah, you meet it all the time in the residence hall, right? Uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, that's a pastoral issue and not an intellectual issue. Uh, that is, by that I mean that if we go back to Lonergan's wonderful distinction between need for certitude and the search for understanding. We all have a need for certitude, right? And whatever it may be in a person's background or that which, which almost forces that person to hold on tightly to something is, um, is what you're dealing with. And I don't think you can deal with it directly. Let me give two examples, right? And one is why I say I think overseas study is so important, particularly for young people who grew up in the most powerful nation on earth and who therefore presume that only we are human beings and the other people are some lower race. Right? Right. Um, I think that that master race thing that we always caricature in the Nazis is, is very much part of American uh, unthinking and, and unreflective thought. Whereas if a person gets into another culture and meets other people who think and act very differently and finds things about them that are immensely attractive, then they're then they're 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 faced with a critical question they have to they have to uh, deal with. Right? Uh, the the other example, I, I'm afraid I've forgotten the other example, but it was it was a good one. <laughs> uh, is oh yes, the certitude business. Uh, A contrast I was trying to develop continually throughout in, in this reflection, although perhaps too abstractly, I'm, I'm sorry for that, was that it's one thing to hold on to a formula and insist that however you see the world must be seen in this way. Right? 
And it's another thing to let that formula carry you beyond it to the very thing that the formula is trying to, ex is trying to express. So when you mention ideological, I, I like to, to make a normative distinction between a tradition and an ideology by reminding us that traditions at their best, and religious traditions are the ones that are, that are, that are most obvious, traditions at their best are always critical of their own expression of their goals. They are self-critical. Whereas an ideology resists criticism, whether it's a, an institutional Marxist ideology that resists criticism by force, or whether it is a politically correct ideology that says there are only certain things that can be said and have to be said in that way, right? So ideology resists criticism, whereas tradition invites it. And that's why I say I think it's fundamentally a pastoral issue. Like you, I'm sure, I'm inclined to get very angry at those people. <laughs> but, um, but what I think they need to do is see in, in us who are hopefully seeking for understanding a, a way of relating to the world that they might one day, when we aren't locked in conflict, find attractive. That's why I say I think it's a pastoral issue. Oh, yes, the second example. Yeah, this is important. Uh, for 16 years, I lived in student residence halls, men's residence halls. And in the wee hours of the morning, I would be debating points of faith. I spent two years in Jerusalem. I returned for 16 years as chaplain for our family student housing, where we had 132 families and 150 children and 27 nationalities. And those same young men who were debating points of faith when their child emerges, these are real questions. So I'm convinced that sometimes, every, especially every young male, uh, simply presumes he came full-blown from the head of Zeus. Uh, and, <laughs> and when that same young man becomes a father, he realizes, my God, I have parents too. You know? So there's something, there's something in that existential, I was talking about practices, there's something in that existential mode uh, which finds that, that one is, need not be so defensive. Oh. Yes, yes ma'am. Can you stand? Because yes. people can see you better. I can yell. Right. I just have a quick question about terminology. Sure. And uh, the nature of rationality. I, just, I don't have this whole text in front of me, but um, in a couple different places, I think first you're quoting, actually, Wench. Lynch. And um, you talk about rationality expressing itself mm -hmm. in different mm -hmm. forms. But then later, I think it's in your own words that you talk about rationality articulated in different forms. Right. So my question is just, are you intending to posit rationality that stands behind these? I mean, expressed and articulated certainly suggests that there is a it's a good philosophy. <laughs> Very good point. Very good point. Uh, I, I think logically what you say is, is accurate. That is, one is, the picture one has is that there is an underlying rationality which is expressed in different ways. Uh, and, and I suppose that's an inevitable picture, isn't it? But the point is, we don't have access to that underlying rationality except through these expressions of it, right? So therefore what we have to do is compare different expressions and presume that they are expressions of rationality. In other words, that's giving the other person the benefit of the doubt, right? And, and, and as we then discuss with that person, we're going to see that however differently we may put it, we can each learn from one another, and that I think is an is a existential evidence of the fact that indeed there is this underlying rationality. It's the same as the natural law debate. Same, same, same thing. Uh, you see, in natural law debate, or natural law debate, a debate about what natural law is, but the, in tra what you're trying to say is, look, there are certain notions that undergird our ethical discourse, right? And uh, those, those notions have a kind of valence which 
if we run roughshod over them, we're getting nowhere, which is, in other words, the argument with the pro-choice issue on abortion is that abortion is more than simply a choice. That's all, right? It doesn't mean that there might not be times when abortion could be justified. That's a whole other question, ethically. But the word abortion, you can't simply say I'm going out and have an abortion like I'm going out and have an ice cream cone. So it just doesn't work, right? So there's this valence that, that language has and certain key terms in language have, which has to be respected. And it'll be respected differently in different cultures, but, but the valence is there, the, the, the force is there, the impact is there. And that's maybe what you're expressing as the underlying rationality. Uh, what, what I'm saying, uh, I, what I'm saying is that I think you're right in the sense of that this discourse presumes that we are all rational beings, right? In, in this discussion, right? So we can't read somebody off like he was worried about his friends, right? Um, but but the only access to that is through some sort of dialogic encounter. Yeah. Yes. yes. certainly recognizes a limitation of the Christian language of speaking about God. But isn't he also approaching those texts as a representative of a group? What texts are we talking about? Oh, the Islamic uh, philosophers, Maimonides. Which of course he is. Um, and we are, of course, endowed with a lot more critical apparatus than Aquinas, right? But Aquinas was a smart guy. And uh, when he read Maimonides, I'll give you a very interesting example. Aquinas had access to Avicenna, or Ibn Sina, through a pretty bad Latin translation. Uh, and the key Arabic words, uh, a word, uh, which means nature or essence, was always translated in this imperfect Latin translation as certitude, charitudo. It doesn't have anything to do with essence or meaning. But Aquinas went right through that, that mistranslation because he picked up the drift of the text. Uh, so uh, in the 13th century, these people were quite convinced that each other were heretics. No question about that, right? Uh, however, what Aquinas recognized was that they too were searching for a way of articulating in their tradition the idea of a free creator, which was central to their tradition and central to ours. And that's what the Vatican II document, Nostra Aetate, notes as connecting us with Islam. We are less convinced that we are, all the other guys are heretics, right? I mean, it's, uh, Vatican II in, in Nostra Aetate introduced a whole different sea change in our attitudes towards the other believer. Uh, I like to think of this in the contemporary world as, as people who are uh, commonly engaged in the, the uh, incredibly taxing task of raising children in a highly permissive society they're going to find help from people of faith, whether the faith is different or the same as theirs, right? And that's the constant experience of people in our world today. So difference in faith when we're in a, when we're in a world which may not give sufficient uh, respect to faith, difference of faith is going to be less important than the fact that a person has faith. So I, so I think that, the, again, the cultural shifts in the world in which we live and the world in which he lived uh, are going to be palpable. Uh, Brian. Um, yeah, uh, I'd like to go back to Holly's uh, point about expressed and articulated notions of reason. Uh, when you first quoted Wicks and he talked about the, uh, the criticism he, he has against McIntyre, if I remember correctly, for failing to come to grips with the fact that reason is embedded in culture, 
It seems to me, this may not be what Holly's getting at, but it seems to me Lonergan makes the differentiation between common sense knowing, which to me is cultural reason, and then there's the theoretical or the explanatory way of beginning to start thinking about things, which is all rooted, well, I don't want to say rooted, but anyway, it seems to, in terms of what Lonergan talks about, in terms of intellectual conversion, that is moving beyond the position that the real is merely what I can sense or in terms of common sense, that the real is something, and we've talked about this, and I, I seek to understand. So I think it seems to me there is a, a, a big difference between those two ways of knowing. Well, I, I would take it a step further. The real, of course, is, is, is what our formulae try to articulate, but which they are never up to uh, adequately doing, right? So that's, all, that's the point I'm trying to make, is that... Is that um, there, there's, a, there's a quest on the part of, of some philosophers, and particularly some, some Neo-Thomist philosophers, right, to get the formula right, right. Whereas Aquinas notes in talking about the names of God that when we're in these arenas, we can at best imperfectly signify what we're talking about. That's pretty neat, imperfectly signify. We're, we're always going to fall short of the mark. And that's where I think conversation with people from other faiths conversation with people under philosophical traditions, we realize the, the intellectual humility that it takes to say, I can never quite get it right. And that's unnerving. Uh, and that, unfortunately, is identified with some people as relativism. I mean, anything goes. That's crazy. You know, I can never quite get it right means that I will need the help of others to understand better what I thought I understood perfectly when I thought I had it right. <laughs> so I think it's this progressive and continuing thing that I'm, and th therefore for me, uh, I have a particular reading of, of Lonigan's theoretical uh, move there, which I think people can almost immediately assimilate to, you know, getting it right. I see that as a set of skills, and I think he did too, because he saw insight as fundamentally a performative book. That is, it's, it's, it's in the performance of these acts of understanding that we come to understand what understanding is, not in the system that we create uh, to try to encapsulate it. But in the theoretical, though, isn't that a way in which then you're able to kind of move beyond the, the kind of cultural embedding of reason and to be able to articulate the foundations for why you understand the world the way that you do so that you can criti critically appropriate it in a much uh, richer way to open up the possibility of horizons of understanding. I, I think that's, that's, that's what we might see as, as a goal. Uh, I no longer see it as a goal. Uh, but but I, I think that w what in effect is that uh, the, what I take Bernard Lonning and mean by theoretical, and then you went on to talk about the, the personal appropriation, you see, so that the theoretical for him is always a penultimate step to the personal appropriation. And that's, it's that existential moment that I want to bring in here. Did I get that right, Joe? Oh, please. Yeah, just a question of curiosity. If you get one way to yourself into a dialogue between a Christian and Islam, what would be your starting point? Faith, reason, or culture? Oh. If, if, I, if we're going to have a dialogue between Christianity and Islam, what would be my starting point? Faith, reason, or culture? That, that, that's one of those wonderful questions because it helps you resume the whole lecture. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> first of all, first of all, there's no such thing as a dialogue between Christianity and Islam. There's dialogue between me as a Christian and someone else as a Muslim, right? Only person's dialogue. That's the key point. So where do persons start from? Where they are, right? From the capacities they have for following arguments and things like that. That would be the use of reason. From their rock-bottom conviction and practices of Eucharistic prayer or, or Salat five times a day. That's where they start. And then the cultural thing is that they become aware of how those practices and that reason has is for them conveniently expressed in a certain way, but other people express it differently, and can we relate the two? Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you very much.